Hey all, welcome back to the Real Life Pharmacology Podcast. I am your host, pharmacist Eric Christensen. Thank you so much for listening today. Uh, Go check out reallifepharmacology.com. You won't be disappointed. I've got a free 31-page PDF on the top 200 drugs. It's a great little study guide. I throw in some of the most common clinical practice things you'll see. Uh, And if you are preparing for board exams and things like that, I also throw in... um, a lot of top clinical pearls that you might often be tested on. So um, definitely go check that out. Get it for free uh, just for subscribing uh, to the podcast. We'll get you emails when we've got a new podcast available and all that sort of stuff. So um, again, reallifepharmacology.com. Uh, go find that free PDF on the top 200 drugs. Again, 31 pages. So I uh, can't, can't miss it. Uh, with that, let's get into the drug of the day today. Amitriptyline. Uh, brand name of this medication is Elevil. Uh, it is an older uh, antidepressant. More specifically, it's a tricyclic antidepressant. Uh, mechanistically, what tricyclics do is they inhibit the reuptake of serotonin and norepinephrine. So obviously, uh, we've heard serotonin in the past, um, talking about SSRIs and things like that. So you could imagine if we're increasing serotonin in the brain that it's going to uh, help for depression. And ultimately, a drug like amitriptyline, when it first came out many, many years ago, um, it was used for depression prior to the advent of the uh, SSRIs. So from a technical standpoint, it is classified as an antidepressant. Um, I... Very rarely now see it used for um, straight depression, okay? Uh, It just doesn't happen very often, and we'll go through kind of the adverse effect profile and and why that's true, Um, but you really don't see it used hardly ever for straight depression. Most often, um, what I've seen amitriptyline used for are various types of pain syndromes, Um, Because remember that serotonin and norepinephrine effect, um, we might have some impacts on pain. So a condition like fibromyalgia, uh, neuropathy, uh, also headache prevention uh, with migraines and and tension headaches. So that's definitely, I would say, the most common situation I see a drug used, uh, I see amitriptyline used for. Uh, You also want to remember your patient population with this drug. It's highly anticholinergic, so it's going to cause problems in our elderly patients, okay? So fibromyalgia, you know, generally something that occurs in younger patients sometimes. Uh, So they might be able to tolerate a drug like amitriptyline a little bit better. Again, it's all going to be kind of dose dependent too. The higher you escalate those doses, uh, the more and more you're going to run into adverse effects, of course, there. Uh, A couple other of maybe rare um, situations or or conditions that I've seen amitriptyline used for, uh, excessive salivation uh, and possibly some um, irritable bowel syndrome, um, GI pain issues as well. So uh, again, but by and large, um, most often I've seen it used for various uh, pain syndromes compared to uh, depression, which is originally what it was uh, marketed for. So let's talk about those side effects a little bit. Uh, anticholinergic, so we're talking dry eyes, dry mouth, constipation, urinary retention, really bothersome, annoying symptoms that are not going to make our patients happy, likely. Okay, And this generally tends to get worse uh, as we uh, get older. Um, In addition to those, uh, we've got to think about fall risk in our elderly patients, confusion. So if you see a patient that has dementia and they start a new dementia medication, you got to go back, look at that medication list and make sure they aren't on a tricyclic antidepressant like amitriptyline. Uh, Of course, they are uh, sedative. Um, going back to indications, on rare occasions, um, I have seen amitriptyline used for insomnia. Uh, that's definitely not something that I really like to see um, because I do feel like we have some other agents 
uh, as well as non-drug interventions, of course, um, that are generally a lot safer than amitriptyline would be um, if we're using it just for uh, insomnia. But from an adverse effect profile standpoint, uh, amitriptyline certainly is uh, sedating. So we got to warn our patients of that with you know, driving and operating machinery and, and all sorts of stuff like that. So again, pay, pay attention to that for sure. Um, rarely anticholinergics, especially as we escalate doses, can um, make patients more susceptible for hyperthermia. So elevated uh, body temp or lack of basically heat tolerance Usually not a big deal in my neck of the woods, uh, where it's generally a little bit cooler, but um, keep that in mind on really hot days during the summer, or if you live in you know tropical southern areas, uh, that might be uh, more of an issue. Um, cardiovascular risk, I did also want to mention, usually as we escalate doses, um, that can uh, come into play potentially where a patient may uh, amitriptyline may put them at higher risk for cardiovascular, uh, negative cardiovascular outcomes. And I would say specifically um, in the situation of overdose, uh, that can really cause some serious cardiac changes. And that is a really, really big concern and is um, certainly one of the reasons why they have fallen out of favor in the management of depression uh, compared to SSRIs, amongst other reasons, of course. All right, so let's take a quick break from our sponsor, and we'll wrap up with some of the most common drug interactions you're going to see. If you're in the market for any pharmacist board certification study material, definitely go check out meded101.com. Uh, if you've been out in practice for a little while and looking to do an exam like BCPS or the geriatric certification or MTM certification, ambulatory care, um, meded101.com slash store has a list of, of great resources there that we've put together uh, to help you pass those exams. In addition, if you're a student, we've got NAPLEX content, so go check that out as well. Same link, meded101.com slash store. And if you're a nurse, nurse practitioner, med student, physician, uh, we've got definitely books on Amazon, case studies, uh, drug interactions, things that will help you um, be a better clinician and or healthcare professional. So uh, go check those out. Support the sponsor. Uh, this obviously helps keep the podcast free uh, for all to uh, enjoy and benefit from. So again, all those links, meded101.com slash store. All right, wrapping up with drug interactions. So what I mentioned the downside with cardiovascular risk and in, in overdose. Um, TCAs and, and amitriptyline tend to have quite a few more drug interactions. And a lot of those interactions are kind of cumulative and or opposing effects. So a perfect example to start off with is uh, the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors like denepazone. Amitriptyline can blunt those effects. So with denepazone, we're trying to help patients' symptoms of dementia well, amitriptyline can block it and cause more confusion. So definitely a, a big downside there. Um, anticholinergic burden. So thinking about the additive effects of dry eyes, mouth, uh, constipation, um, worsening you know, BPH symptoms with urinary retention, for example, amitriptyline can contribute to that anticholinergic. So you've got to think about other meds the patient is taking. Maybe they're on a hydroxazine for anxiety. Maybe they like to take Benadryl uh, for their allergy symptoms. That's going to have a cumulative type effect with amitriptyline and certainly be a negative for sure. Uh, CNS depressant effect, amitriptyline's sedating. So of course, taking it with other sedating medications could potentially uh, lead you to an excessive uh, sedation type problem. CYP2D6 inhibitors uh, that can increase the effects of amitriptyline, so that's important to uh, remember there. Uh, QT prolongation, cardiovascular risk, uh, we've got to think about that with amitriptyline, and again, usually as those doses escalate 
or the patient is on other medications um, that can cause that issue, like amiodarone, quinolones, antipsychotics, um, that can cause drug interactions and a cumulative type effect of prolonging the QT interval. And then lastly, I wanted to mention uh, serotonin syndrome. So these drugs like amitriptyline are going to increase serotonin in the brain potentially. And if the patient's taking other medications that could do that, uh, your tramadols, your um, SSRIs, uh, that can potentially um, lead to some big risks there. Uh, lastly, I did want to mention MAOIs. Uh, they aren't used hardly ever in clinical practice, but it is a uh, contraindication certainly to use those uh, with amitriptyline. All right, so I think that's going to wrap up the podcast for today. I hope you found this beneficial. Uh, if you enjoyed the show, leave a rating review on iTunes or wherever uh, you're listening. That's greatly appreciated appreciated by me. Uh, so definitely go take the, the time to do that. And of course, share us with friends, colleagues, uh, students that may be working with you, anyone that could benefit from pharmacology education. Uh, it's a, a great free resource for anybody uh, to benefit from, certainly. Uh, if you want to reach out to me, Eric Christensen, you can find me on LinkedIn, or you can track me down mededucation101 at gmail.com. Again, take advantage of that free resource at reallifepharmacology.com, a free 31-page PDF on the top 200 drugs. And I am going to sign off for today. I thank you so much for listening, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.